بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد The relationship that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had with his companions was intimate and very special. And then the relationship that existed with some of the more senior companions, those that were very close to him, in particular, the four khulafa that followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, was even more special because they were brought into the family of the Prophet ﷺ. On one side, you had Abu Bakr and Umar anhuma, whose daughters Rasulullah ﷺ married. Sayyida Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha and Sayyida Umm al-Mu'mineen Hafsa radiallahu anha. As for the other two, Uthman radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an, they became the son-in-laws of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With Uthman radiallahu an not marrying just one daughter of the Prophet of Allah, but after the older daughter passed away, he then went on to marry the younger daughter as well. Hence, earning the unique title of Dhinnurain, Dhinnurain, the one that possessed two lights, Referring to the two daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hafsa radiallahu anha was the daughter of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, and also the great wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The scholars differ on when exactly she was born. There's a difference of opinion among the scholars. Um, most of them claim that it was some years prior to prophethood. She was one of the first to accept Islam. She migrated to Abyssinia with her husband and then later on in, uh, migrated a second time to Medina Munawwara. When she was in Medina Munawwara, her husband Khunais bin Hudafa as Sahami passed away. He participated with Rasulullah in the Battle of Badr. However, he passed away from an injury that he sustained uh, in Uhud. After he passed away, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab an had a desire to have his daughter married again. She was in a lot of pain, she missed her husband a lot, she spent a lot of time crying and grieving. So Umar radiallahu an went to his dear friends and companions for the proposal of marriage. He went to Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an and made proposal of marriage. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an refused. He went to Uthman radiallahu an and said, would you like to marry my daughter? Uthman radiallahu an also refused. This was difficult for Umar radiallahu anh because these were friends of his and he was quite sure that they would be interested in establishing this relationship for them to be related to Umar radiallahu anh. They didn't say anything. He took his complaint to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, I proposed my daughter to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh and he did not show much interest and then I went to Uthman radiallahu anh, the same thing. What's happening here? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يَتَزَوَّجُ حَفْصَةَ مَنْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ عُثْمَانِ وَمَنْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَبِي بَكْرِ That someone greater than Uthman and Abu Bakr will find the companionship of Hafsa radiallahu anha will be her spouse. Umar radiallahu anha didn't understand. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the proposal himself. Umar radiallahu anhu was so overwhelmed and excited that where he hoped for a relationship with Abu Bakr and Uthman radiallahu anhu, the proposal came from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And later on, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an said to him, this was the reason why we said no, because we had heard Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, make an intention of marriage to your daughter Hafsa radiallahu anha. And therefore, creating a new bond and a new relationship between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an said, فَلَمْ أَكُنْ لِأُفْشِي سِرَّهُ وَلَوْ تَرَكَهَا لَتَزَوَّجْتُهَا That I had no intention of exposing the secret of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If the Prophet of Allah had left her and left his intention, then I would have taken the honor of marrying your daughter Hafsa radiallahu anha. Hafsa radiallahu anha was just a few years older than her younger brother, Sayyidina Ibn Umar radiallahu an, six years older. Ibn Umar radiallahu an recovered him previously, the close companion of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the student of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one that became a teacher for the ummah. He had a special connection with the Prophet of Allah through his sister, Hafsa radiallahu anha. She would speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his behalf if he had a question. Hafsa radiallahu anha was very observant of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She studied Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very carefully like the other wives and therefore went on to narrate so many ahadith regarding the personal life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would sleep, what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make dua for, how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guided the ummah on certain very specific matters. For example, she says, Hafsa radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inni la arju an la yadkhulu nar insha'Allah ahadun shahida badran wal hudaybiyya. The Prophet of Allah said, that I have hope in Allah that any person who participated in the battle of, uh, uh, battle of Badr or Hudaybiyyah shall not enter into the fire of hell. So Hafsa radiallahu anha, she was a scholar of the Qur'an, very knowledgeable. She then said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you say none of them will enter into the fire of hell, but did Allah azawajal not say, وَإِمْ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا That there is not one of you, but they will have to pass by that fire of hell. Surah Maryam. So what about this? So then Hafsa radiallahu anha herself says, that I heard the Prophet of Allah saying, ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ وَنَذَرُ الظَّالِمِينَ فِيهَا جِثِيَّةِ Following verse Surah Maryam 71, وَإِمْ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيَّةِ And then the next verse Allah Azza wa Jal says, ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ We will protect and save those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That yes, people will pass by, but Allah Azza wa Jal will protect his beloved ones, his servants, his slaves, those that were loyal to him in the dunya, so they will not be affected by passing by in any way at all. Hafsa radiallahu anha, she says, regarding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa she studied the Prophet of Allah, she had a very close eye on the Prophet of Allah. That Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when performing salah, never sat down and prayed his salah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَا رَأَيْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يُصَلِّي جَالِسًا حَتَّى كَانَ قَبْلَ وَفَاتِهِ بِعَامٍ أَوْ عَمَيْنِ The Prophet of Allah never sat down and prayed salah. When he prayed salah, he prayed it standing. Just until the end of his life, one or two years before, then we began to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started praying in a seated position. The riwayat tell us that as Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam grew older and aged, there was a knee pain that came into play. And so the Prophet Sallallahu even when standing up from sajda, would lean against his arms and he would push himself up. The Prophet Sallallahu would sit in a posture, relieving some pressure from his knees even while in salah. Hafsa radiallahu anha says that one day, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered upon her, دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا وَعِنْدَهَا إِمْرَأَةٌ يُقَالُ لَهَا شفاء. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Hafsa radiallahu anha's home and Shifa bint Abdullah radiallahu anha was there. She was doing some ruqya in that moment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Shifa radiallahu anha, Allimiha Hafsata. This ruqya that you're doing, teach it to Hafsa radiallahu anha. Let her be a teacher of ruqya. Let her be a scholar of Ruqya. Shifa bint Abdullah radiallahu anha was a very knowledgeable female companion. 
She was known among the companions as being someone who knew a lot. They say that she taught the other Sahaba um, how to read and write. She was very well versed in the Quran. There are these interactions that Shifa anha had with Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab an. And here we see as well, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Shifa anha that teach this ruqya to Hafsa radiallahu anha. Hafsa radiallahu anha narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يحل لإمرأة تؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر أو بالله ورسوله أن تحد على ميت فوق ثلاث إلا على زوج that it is not permissible for a female, for a woman who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment that they mourn over the deceased person for more than three days unless it is a spouse because there we see that Allah tells us that the waiting period is much longer arba'ata ashfurin wa ashra four months and ten days this is an important lesson because among the Arabs, the Jahili practice was that when a person died, their family members would keep their memory alive through the act of mourning. And depending on how great that person was, they would have a greater show. So if a leader passed away, then everyone in the tribe would cry, showing how important this person was, how much that person meant to them. But this self-inflicted trauma had a massive impact. It caused people in society to be broken. They would sing poetry about that person for years and years to come. And the wives to show their loyalty to their husbands would be expected by society to, to camp out at their husband's graves. And as a result of this, all sorts of rituals came into play. Some were a direct, a direct cause to further shirk. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, brings Islam, there is this period where the Prophet of Allah stops all of it. He says, no one will visit the grave. No female or no, no male. Visiting the graveyard is off the limits for everyone. Why did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam take this stance? The reason why the Prophet of Allah took this stance was to put an end to this custom and this practice. It was such an important part of Jahili culture and had such a big impact on the psychology of people and also their faith that Rasulullah called Turkey, no more. And we see this in many practices that when something was so deeply embedded in society, the Prophet would suggest avoid it, avoid it, avoid it, and then when the prohibition would come, it would be a strong no, like we see in Khamar. The Prophet not only forbade the companions from consuming anything intoxicating, on top of that, the Prophet ﷺ also said to them, you cannot even use the containers that you would previously drink from. You can't even use the containers because those containers, those bottles, that shape will remind you. So we're doing no to all of this. We're putting an end to it. And then later on, the Prophet ﷺ said, you can now use those containers that you were previously, you know, that you previously had and you stored your drinks in as long as you do not drink anything intoxicant. Don't drink anything intoxicating, you can go back to using those containers. Similarly, when it comes to this issue of visiting the graveyards, Rasulullah said, and we know that visiting the graveyards is an important part of our deen. Because visiting the graveyard is a reminder of the temporary nature of this world. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to honor those that have left the dunya by giving them salam, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, "Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyarat al qubur." I used to previously, previously prohibit you from visiting the graveyards. Allah fazuruha. Now go and visit them. That important cause, that worry, that concern that we had, we've dealt with it. The culture has come to an end. Allah fazuruha. And throughout, the Prophet ﷺ gave many warnings that we're not reviving this. And unfortunately, we Muslims fall back into this trap. My mother, Allah Arhama, said to me once that there are so many beautiful things about Muslims because she was a convert to Islam. She said, I, there are so many beautiful things about Islam as Muslims, but there's one thing that I don't understand about Muslims. Why do you copy Hindus in some of your practices? I was puzzled and I said, Mama, we don't, there, there's nothing that Muslims copy or you know, Islam uh, imitates Hinduism in. What is this that you're, that you're speaking of? She said, 
in our religion, when someone dies, we have all these rituals. You know, the third day, the fourth day, the seventh day, the tenth day, the fortieth day. I see Muslims doing all of this again. Why is that? What I saw there, I see here. And immediately I said to her, Mama, all these practices that you see Muslims doing have nothing to do with Islam. They have nothing to do with Islam. In Islam, when a person passes away, we honor them by giving them the most pristine burial. We do ghusl for them, we give them kafan, we walk with them to the burial ground, we bury them, we make dua, we do salatul janazah on them, right? And then after that person is buried, we then make dua for them and give sadaqah on their behalf, and a person grieves and, and mourns them. The Prophet ﷺ told us for three days that's permissible, then after that, you have to move back to life. Now, that doesn't mean three days later you have to forget them. That doesn't mean three days later you can't cry for them anymore. That's a part of the human experience, that we, we recover from our emotions in different ways. But when Rasulullah says there's no grieving after three days, what, we're, what we are actually taught is that now you have to start making an effort to recover. Maybe the first three days you spend them at home, if that's what you need to do. But the fourth day, you gotta go grocery shopping. The fourth day, you need to go fill up your gas. The fourth day, you need to go back to the masjid and start praying salah again. Yes, it's hard. It's not easy. Our dear Imam uh, in Dallas, one of our dear Imams in, in Dallas, I won't say his name. He buried his daughter. He buried his daughter earlier in the day. And by Maghrib salah, he was standing in the masjid leading them in jama'ah again. The whole congregation was in tears. Everyone was in tears because they knew that this man just buried his own daughter. His teenage daughter, he just buried her today. And he stood there and led them in Maghrib Salah. He's in tears, the whole congregation is in tears. That you slowly start recovering, you move on. Otherwise, if you stay in that memory and you, and you bury yourself in that pain, you can't recover. Hafsa radiallahu anha narrates this beautiful hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam focus this on the women? Because they were the leaders in this cultural practice. It was almost culturally expected of them that you have to cry more, you have to do extra. The Prophet is saying, do your bit, but then you have to start recovering. The recovery process must be there. Another narration from Hafsa radiallahu anha, she says the Prophet when he would come to bed, when he would lie down to sleep, he would place his right hand under his cheek. He would place his right hand under his cheek. وقال, and then he would say, Rabbi qini adabaka yawma tabaathu ibadak thalathan. He would say three times, Oh Allah, protect me from your punishment on the day your servants shall be resurrected. Oh Allah, protect me from your punishment on the day your servants shall be resurrected. Oh Allah, protect me from your punishment on the day your servants shall be resurrected. Now from this we learn the adab of sleeping and how in one narration she actually further elaborates on the same point. She says, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would use his right hand for noble things when he would eat anything that he was doing that had virtue to it, he would use his right hand for that. And if he did something that required cleaning, if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did something that May, uh, may had some filth involved or a little dirt involved, for that he would dedicate his left hand. Showing us the attention that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave to things. Everything had some detail to it, everything had a process to it. And until you don't, you know, this is a side note, when you start studying the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and going through the sunnahs and see how everything had a tartib and sequence. When using the bathroom, when waking up, when doing wudu, everything had a sequence. Rasulullah did wudu in a particular sequence and he did it in that sequence his entire life. He did ghusl in a particular way. Those that saw him perform ghusl from his family members attest to the ghusl being the same ghusl every time. Rasulullah prayed salah, it was in that same sequence. And throughout his life you'll see this, the way he ate, the way he sat. Yes, sometimes the Prophet would step out of that routine bayanan lil jawaz to let people know that this wasn't necessary, it wasn't mandatory. And this tartib, this sequence that existed in the life of Rasulullah is fascinating. Some years back, I used to teach a class. It was called A Day in the Life of the Prophet. 
And the idea behind that class was to take the audience and the student through what a 24-hour day of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked like. And there were certain parts of the day that were very structured. It was very predictable what Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was doing. And there were other parts of the day that were kind of more flexible. Sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be in the souq in the market. Other times he would be with family members. Sometimes he'd be sitting with the women of Medina Munawwara to solve their issues or to answer their questions. Like it was something that the Prophet ﷺ would do depending on what was needed of him in that moment. And one comment that I would always make while teaching that class was, from the day of the Prophet ﷺ, one lesson that you can walk away with is a lesson of tartib. That everything had a sequence, it had a process. And this shows us that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do things thoughtlessly. When he did something, even if it was something like putting a shirt on, putting a lower garment on, putting his footwear on, it was with intention, it was with purpose. And it's at this point that when a person does something with purpose and with tartib, with the right sequence consistently, that they then start finding meaning in what they do and they then go on to perfect that. Whether it's a khutbah, khatira, studying, that you then get better and better and better at it. But when a person wakes up in the morning and they don't know what their tartib is, they don't know what their sequence is, that causes them, that trickles down and makes a mess of their day and then by extension makes a mess of their life. You need to find your tartib. You need to find what is it that your routine entails. Last night when my son Muhammad was going to sleep, I said this to him again, that Beta, I want you to work on your morning routine. Whatever that entails, you figure it out. But I need you to work on it. I need you to know what your routine is. Does your routine start by using the washroom, then maybe changing, then maybe brushing your teeth, then maybe doing your wudu, then heading back to your bed and fixing your bed, followed by Fajr Salah, then some recitation of the Quran, then changing into your school clothes, having your breakfast, heading off and sitting in the car waiting for your mother to arrive. That might be your sequence. And if that's your sequence, follow it every day. Make that your time. That you wake up, if you're supposed to wake up at 5.30 a.m., you shouldn't wake up at 6, you shouldn't wake up at, wake up at 6.30, you should wake up at 5.30 a.m. That's your tartib. And when a person creates this discipline in life, you no longer even need an alarm clock. Is this true? Even if there's no alarm set, there's an internal clock that wakes you up. It's time for you to start moving. You gotta get up, you gotta move. But for this tartib, you need some discipline. You need to see the value in it. You must understand how this benefits you. And it has benefits on so many levels. When you fulfill the tasks that you know are necessary for a particular part of the day, you begin to then have confidence in yourself that I can actually execute something from beginning to end. That all the things that I did make me strong in believing in myself. My mind is now clear that I accomplished things that needed to be done. Nothing left behind is a mess. I didn't skip my responsibilities. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had tartib and everything. And this, the second part of the statement of Hafsa radiallahu anha, this teaching, this riwayah from Hafsa radiallahu anha, that after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ready to go to sleep and his hand was in the right place, that's probably the last thing most of us do before we go to sleep, the adjustment of the arms. You know, people have their different ways of sleeping. Once you adjust your arms, now you're ready to go to sleep. But she says once he adjusted his arms, he didn't just go to sleep. He didn't just plop his eyes closed and... <laughs> Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ended it all by رَبِّ قِينِي عَذَابَكَ يَوْمَ تَبَعَثُ عِبَادَكَ With a dua. O oh Allah, protect me from your punishment on that day. Your servants shall be resurrected. Sayyidah Umm al-Mu'minin Hafsa radiallahu anha narrates, that one time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting with me. Dakhala alayya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the And his garment was, you know, wasn't properly on. Like he had his garment half on. You know, when you're sitting with family, sometimes your arm may be exposed a little bit. Uh, your, your pant may be a little higher than you would normally have if you were in a public gathering. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, he came to the house, he sought permission. The Prophet of Allah gave permission. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, he came in, wa Rasulullah ala hayatihi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made no adjustment of his garment. He didn't, you know, enter into a state of formality. 
ثم جاء عمر يستأذن فأذن له رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على هيئته سيدنا عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه came he sought permission النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم granted him the permission he then sat in front of the Prophet of Allah and the Prophet of Allah made no change at all وجاء ناس من أصحابه and then a few other people came too فأذن لهم وجاء علي يستأذن فأذن له رسول الله على هيئتي سيدنا علي رضي الله عنه also was in that gathering the Prophet of Allah remained seated in his same position. ثم جاء عثمان بن عفان فاستأذن فتجلل ثوبه ثم أذن له. Sayyidina Uthman رضي الله عنه came, he sought permission. Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم mended his garment, he fixed it. And then he gave him permission. فتحدثوا ساعة ثم خرجوا. There was some conversation that pursued, ensued and then after that they left. I asked a messenger of Allah that all these other people came دَخَلَ عَلَيْكَ أَبُو بَكْرٍ وَعُمَرٍ وَعَلِي وَنَاسُ مِنْ أَصْحَابِكَ وَأَنْتَ عَلَى هَيْئَتِكَ وَلَمْ تَحَرَّكْ فَلَمَّا دَخَلَ عُثْمَانُ تَجَلَّلْتَ ثَوْبَكَ That all these people came and you made no movement, you left your garment the way it was, but when Uthman came, you fixed your garment. Why is that? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, أَلَا أَسْتَحْيِي مِنْ مَنْ تَسْتَحْيِي مِنْهُ الْمَلَائِكَ Should I not be modest in front of the one that even the malaika are shameful of? The malaika look down with Uthman They have a special level of modesty from him because of the way he carries himself. And this shows us, you know, a lesson that أَنزِلُ النَّاسَ مَنَازِلَهُمْ That everyone has something special. The way you dress in front of your friends may not be the way you dress in front of your teacher. The way you dress in your bedroom may not be the way you dress in front of your parents. When I was young, like all the kids that were young, we used to like wearing like, you know, basketball shorts, a little more comfortable when you're at home, and kind of you know, wear some shirt. And I remember every time I came into the main room where my dad was, if he saw me wearing shorts, that was the end of it. There was going to be a half an hour lecture. He would probably swing to see if he could hit me. And then he would say something like, you know, what are you doing, you monkey? You're John Wada, go, go get changed. And he would say, you know, like you're in front of your parents. Go fix your clothes. And wearing clothes like that at a mealtime was unimaginable because there was, an, there was a special honor for food culturally, you know, that you don't eat like this. You dress a particular way when you come to the table or when you sit on the ground to eat. When you go to the masjid, you know, every time we would walk out for salah time, um, our parents would say to us, that, you know, fix your clothes, go put something nice on, go put some itar on. Because there is a place and time for everything. Hafsa radiallahu anha also has some very fascinating interactions with her father. She not only narrates from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and observes some practices and narrates them from the other companions, but she has these interesting interactions with her father too. Hafsa radiallahu anha noticed that while her father was khalifa, he didn't engage in any of the luxuries of being a khalifa. There was wealth available. The Roman Persian Empire had been conquered. I mean, we're talking about millions and billions worth of wealth arriving now in Medina Munawwara. It was easy for Umar radiallahu anh to indulge a little. She saw that her father didn't. So then she one day approached her father and said, قَدْ أَكْفَرَ اللَّهُ الْخَيْرَ Allah has caused good to be in abundance now. وَأَوْسَعَ الرِّزْقَ And he has expanded for us the sustenance. فَلَوْ أَكَلْتَ تَعَامًا أَلْيَنَ مِنْ تَعَامِكَ وَأَطْيَبَ مِنْ تَعَامِكَ وَلَبِسْتَ ثَوْبًا أَلْيَنَ مِنْ ثَوْبِكَ Isn't that appropriate? Isn't that okay now for you to eat something better? Why don't you drink something better? How about we get you in some, to some nicer clothes? She's speaking to her father. Her father is now an old person. He is Amir al-Mu'mineen. She's seen the grind of her father's life. And uh, you can imagine the love and the compassion that this daughter has for her Baba. And she says, come on, man. We have so much available. Why don't you change it up a little bit? So Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, he said to her, you were the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell me how did the Prophet of Allah eat? She went silent. You were his wife. Tell me about his drink. She had nothing to say. Hafsa radiallahu anha may have remembered that one day when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam visited her, the, 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 the mat that the Prophet of Allah would sleep on, the sheet that he slept, he slept on, that little blanket, in order to bring more comfort to the Prophet of Allah, instead of just folding it once, one time she folded it twice. That morning, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam overslept a little, and then he said, 
the softness of the bed caused us to be delayed in our prayer. This is Rasulullah who found it uncomfortable to sleep on a platform that had been folded one time extra. So he continued, he said, tell me about the Prophet Wasallam's clothes. Tell me about his house. You were his wife, tell me about his furniture. And he continued addressing her and فَمَا زَالَ يُذَكِّرُهَا مَا كَانَ فِيهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَمَا كَانَتْ مَعَهُ حَتَّى أَبْكَاهَا He took her so deep into the memory of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم that she started crying. She broke out into tears that yes, that was Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Then he said, I had two friends. Umar رضي الله عنه said, I had two friends. إِنَّهُ كَانَ لِي صَاحِبَانِ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا And they treaded a path while they were alive. وَإِنِّي إِنْ سَلَكْتُ غَيْرَ طَرِيقِهِمَا سُلِكَ بِي غَيْرُ طَرِيقِهِمَا If I choose a path other than theirs in this world, what if I am separated from them on the path in the hereafter? I want to be with them in the hereafter. Abu Bakr and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way I'm going to do that is by sticking to their example in this dunya. By Allah, I will continue to join them in a tough life. So then we can enjoy the luxurious one together as well. Hafsa radiallahu anha has this conversation with her father. She then goes on to say in another narration that I heard my father making dua. My baba used to make one dua. Allahumma arzuqni shahadatan fi sabilik wa ja'al mawti fi baladi rasulik. That I heard my father saying, O oh Allah, grant me martyrdom in your path and make my death in the city of your beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, that's got to do a toll on you. That's got to do a number on you, like in a good way. That you hear your father making dua for shahada. That you hear your father saying that, Oh Allah, give me death in the city of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You learn a lesson from that. Hafsa radiallahu anha was very close to Ummul Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha as co-wives. And this had some interesting consequences. When Aisha radiallahu anha would plan something, whether it was against some of the other co-wives or if she had anything that she was trying to accomplish, she would include Hafsa radiallahu anha. Umar radiallahu anha, when he saw this dynamic, he said to Hafsa radiallahu anha that this alliance of yours is good and also tricky. It's good because you're with good people. But it's also tricky because you have to understand that if whatever it is that you're scheming or planning as a part of your you know, personal affairs, your marital life, if it doesn't work out, Aisha radiallahu anha is very dear and the most beloved of his wives to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And not only that, but her father is so special to the Prophet of Allah that there is no scenario that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would ever say anything to her or her father. And then he said to his daughter, Hafsa, your father isn't the same as her father. And your relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is special, it's good, it's nice. But it's not the same as Aisha radiallahu anhas. So be careful that an act of yours doesn't cause hurt to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because if something you say or do invokes the anger of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the outcome of that will be the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are in no place to be under the anger of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar radiallahu anh was very careful around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way he spoke, the way he carried himself. And he would warn his daughter, Hafsa radiallahu anha, to be careful. 
There's this long narration that you can find in the hadith books. Part, parts of it exist in Sahih Muslim and then within the other hadith collections as well. Um, it's the riwayah of Zuhri from Sayyiduna Ibn Abbas radiallahu This is a long narration. I'm going to try to cover uh, as much as we can in this class while kind of breezing through other parts of it. عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنه قال لم أزل حريصا أن أسأل عمر عن المرأتين من أزواج النبي اللتين قال الله تعالى إن تتوبا إلى الله فقد سغط قلوبكما سيدنا عبد الله بن عباس رضي الله عنه said I had a desire to ask Umar رضي الله عنه regarding the two people that were addressed in Surah Tahrim in that fourth verse إِن تَتُوبَ إِلَى اللَّهِ فَقَدْ سَغَطْ قُلُوبُكُمَا وَإِن تَظَاهَرَ عَلَيْهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ مَوْلَاهُ وَجِبْرِيلُ وَصَالِحُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was addressing two of the wives of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this fourth verse of Surah Tahreem. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an had a desire to ask Umar radiallahu an. حَتَّى حَجَّ عُمَرُ وَحَجَجْتُ مَعَهُ I waited and waited for the opportunity to ask him. He didn't ask why, because the common interpretation was the ayah was referring to Hafsa radiallahu anha and who is she? Umar radiallahu an's daughter. He didn't know if he was crossing a line by asking if that ayah that is calling them to do tawbah was referring to his own daughter. And then Umar radiallahu an was who he was. So he says that I had this fear and I didn't want to cross any lines. So I waited for my opportunity. We went for hajj. While we were doing hajj, Umar radiallahu an stepped aside to use the washroom and when it came time for him to do wudu فَسَكَبْتُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ I poured the water of wudu for him and while I was pouring the water of wudu and he was doing wudu I said يَا أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ مَنِ الْمَرْأَتَيْنِ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِ النَّبِيِ أَلَّتَانِ قَارَ اللَّهُ لَهُمَا إِنْ تَتُوبَا إِرَى اللَّهِ فَقَدْ صَغَدْ قُلُوبُكُمَا That who were those two women? Well, in the middle of wudu he asked him. What's the, what's the tafsir of this ayah? And then in one narration, he said to Umar radiallahu an, that I waited one year to ask this question and I didn't because I was worried that it may upset you. So in that narration, Umar radiallahu an said to him, never fear me. If you have a question asked, as long as I know the answer, I will give it to you. So Umar radiallahu an, he said, وَعَجَبًا لَكَ يَا ابْنَ عَبَّاسِ What amazement, such amazement for you, O son of Abbas, you ask a question like this. And then he said, هِيَ حَفْسَةُ وَعَائِشَةً That ayah, is, that ayah was talking about Umm al-Mu'mineen, Hafsa radiallahu anha and Aisha radiallahu anha. Now, what is this ayah talking about? What's the backdrop, context of this verse? There are two tafsirs that are present. There is one tafsir, which is more common in the more Sahih one. The narration can be found in the Sahih collections, Bukhari and Muslim. And then there's a second tafsir of that verse, which is more weaker and also potentially could be viewed somewhat problematic as well. So I'm not going to engage in the second one. I'm just going to focus on the more Sahih one and the more authentic one. The riwayah is Aisha radiallahu anha noticed that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was spending more time with one of her co-wives, Zainab radiallahu anha. And the reason why he was spending more time there is because every time the Prophet of Allah came to visit Zainab radiallahu anha, she made it a practice to offer the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa one of his favorite drinks. And the Prophet's favorite drink was ma'ul barid ma'al asr, some cold water mixed with honey. Like you guys might have Kool-Aid or Tango, something nice and sweet mixed in there. He would drink it. And you know, she would take her time in making the drink the Prophet ﷺ would wait and then he would serve it and he would also cherish the drink. Aisha radiallahu anha noticed that there's something going on here. And she didn't like it. So she said to Hafsa radiallahu anha, here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell the Prophet of Allah that there is a smell emerging from him. And Nabi Wasallam did not like any sort of smell or foul smell because he would interact with malaika. So he would avoid consuming anything that had a foul scent to it. The Prophet ﷺ came to visit them and they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, there's a smell coming from you as if some kind of a bitter you know, stench. Nabi Wasallam said, no, I just had honey. They said, well, maybe something, honey, I don't know, something's off with that honey. Maybe it's like from 
some bootleg farmer's market honey. So Rasulullah sallallahu then take an, took an oath that wallahi I will never have that drink again. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. Tabtaghi mardata azwajik. Wallahu ghafur rahim. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the verse that why do you prohibit on yourself that which Allah has made halal? One thing is that a person says that I won't eat something, like I don't like um, liver, for example, I don't like kidneys, I don't like eating intestines, I don't like eating tongue, I don't like eating brain. You can avoid eating whatever you want to. But the other is that you take an oath, Wallahi, I won't eat this or it's haram upon me. You can't make something halal, haram. A person doesn't like eating meat, don't eat it. Meat is haram, okay buddy, calm down. Right? That's not true. Rather, Allah says in the Quran, أَتَسْتَبْدِلُونَ الَّذِي هُوَ أَدْنَى بِالَّذِي هُوَ خَيْرٌ You can't go around changing the rulings of Islam. If something is halal, it's halal. If you don't like it, don't do it. If you like it, go ahead. لِمَا تُحَرِّمُ مَا Because Nabi Sallallahu is also sharia. The sharia is based off of the hukum of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The doing of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. تَبَتَغِي أَزْوَاجِكَ so it was regarding this incident that the ayah of the Qur'an was revealed uh, in Surah Tahrim. So now we go back to that narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. Imam Zuhri, um, he narrates the whole narration as I was mentioning. One time what happened is, so Umar radiallahu an actually played a role in Hafsa radiallahu anha's life as a father even after she was married. One time Umar was at home with one of his wives in Medina Munawwara and she was, that two of them had got like into a um, sort of a passionate conversation. So Umar said to his wife that why are you giving, like, you know, pro, why are you so excited about a conversation that has little to do with you? The women in our time did not do this. He was referring to the Makkan culture that in Mecca Muqarma, women had a different role in the household and in society. And uh, if, 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 the, if, the, if the head of the household made a decision that, was, that didn't directly impact everyone, that was final. That was their decision to make. So he said to his wife, that, why are you engaging with me like this? So she said, um, well, the wives of the Prophet of Allah do the same, so we're just following their footsteps. Umar said, what do you mean? You're saying that the wives of the Prophet of Allah, they speak to the Prophet of Allah with their voices raised? She said, go ask your daughter. So Umar radiallahu an came to Hafsa radiallahu anha. And um, he, he asked her, what's going on here? Is this true? So Hafsa radiallahu anha said, yeah, it's true. When we speak to the Prophet of Allah, things could, you know, they can find their own flow. Umar radiallahu an told her, I told you not to do these things. They can have a very negative outcome. The ghadab of Allah and his messenger. He went to Umm Salma radiallahu anha and he said the same thing to him. That, you know, what is this that you guys, I hear that you guys speak like this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is this true? Umm Salma radiallahu anha, she says to him that it's better that you don't get involved in the personal affairs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his wives. So he gets shut out. Umar radiallahu anha just, he's lost for words. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, was stationed in an area, in a, in a, in a room. So he went immediately uh, and um, to meet Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He couldn't enter into the room because there was a doorkeeper. Some narrations tell us this was Bilal radiallahu anh, that was stationed outside. Umar radiallahu anh, sought permission. The doorkeeper said, the Messenger of Allah is not taking any visitors right now. He said, went again and he said, man, tell him it's Umar. So he went back and told the Prophet of Allah, it's Umar. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay, call him. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh entered. قَالَ أُدْخُلْ فَقَدْ أَذِنَ لَكْ فَدَخَلْتُ فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ I gave salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَإِذَا هُوَ مُتَّكِيُونَ عَلَىٰ رَمْلِ حَصِيرٍ قَدْ أَثَّرَ فِي جَنْبِهِ When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw me, he sat up and the marks of the straw mat that he was laying against had impressed into his arm, imprinted. Qultu, Umar radiallahu an, he just came out and asked the main question. Attallaqta ya Rasulullah nisa'ak. O Messenger of Allah, we've heard that there's been some dispute between you and your wives. 
did you divorce them? فَرَفَعَ رَأْسَهُ إِلَيَّ وَقَالَ لَا Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi raised his head to me and he said, no, I haven't. فَقُلْتُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ Umar radiallahu anh started celebrating. He was happy and relieved because his, wife, his daughter wasn't divorced from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was worried about this. By the way, Hafsa radiallahu anha, um, due to uh, an interaction with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and something that she did that caused you know, um, displeasure to the Prophet of Allah, led, you know, th there was an interaction that she had with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that is to do with their marriage that resulted in the Prophet of Allah actually divorcing her. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually did give Hafsa radiallahu anha a divorce. And then not too long later, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back and smiled at her. And he, he revoked that divorce. And she said, what happened? He said, Jibreel Alayhi Salaam came to me. And he said to me, Innaha sawwama qawwama. She worships Allah and she fasts. She is beloved to Allah. It is not appropriate. Take her back into your nikah. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he revoked that talaq and she entered back into the marriage of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now you come to this story. Umar radiallahu an, he says, Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah. And then he says, O Messenger of Allah, in Makkah Mukarramah, things were different. Men had a stronger role in the household. But now we've arrived in Medina Munawwara, and here in the household, the women play a stronger role. It's a different culture, different environment. And it's fascinating if you think about this, because in Medina Munawwara, the major trade for the Muslims there was farming and agriculture, which is a family affair. Everyone chips in together. You work together, you earn together, you live together. So it's a different dynamic in that, in that sort of a household. Versus in Makkah Mukarramah, it was mostly tijara, which required long safar, which was mostly something the men did. So therefore, because they were the sole bread winners and these were the people that were earning for the family and the women mostly managed the, managed the domestic affairs of the house, household, their influence on the relationship and on the decisions made were also different. They were in accordance to that. So he makes this uh, observation and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, uh, things in Makkah Mukarramah were different, things in Medina Munawwara are, are different. The Prophet ﷺ, when he heard this and saw this observation of Umar when he smiled, he said, yes, Umar, in Mecca things were different. And this was the first time the Prophet ﷺ smiled in days since the whole conflict started. It had been a long time since he saw Rasulullah ﷺ. It's a long narration, but to um, kind of jump to the end of it. When Umar ﷺ was getting ready to leave, فَرَفَعْتُ رَأْسِي فِي الْبَيْتِ فَوَاللَّهِ مَا رَأَيْتُ فِيهِ شَيْئًا يَرُدُّ الْبَصَرَ إِلَّا أَهَبًا ثَلَاثَةً That I, when it was time for me to leave, I looked around the room that the Prophet of Allah was sitting in. And there was nothing in that room except for three skins. There were three leather skins there. That was it. And when he walked into the room, the Prophet ﷺ just sat up. And there were, there were these marks in his arm from the mat that he was lying down on. And for Umar عنه, this was an overwhelming sight. Because he saw the Prophet of Allah going through so much emotionally. He knew of the spiritual sacrifice of the Prophet of Allah. And here he sees how Rasulullah didn't live like a king. Because in our world, when people gain access to fame, when people gain access to wealth, their life changes. Their house changes, their car changes, what they dress, where they go, who they hang out with, all of that changes. You're no longer just sleeping on a mattress, you now have a pillow cushioned mattress. It's memory foam now, it can go up and down. You know, there are these features attached to it. And he's looking at the Prophet وسلم, and even though he is the head of state, he is the leader of the Muslims, there are companions who have great wealth and if by one instruction, you know, he could, he could benefit from that and they would do it with honor. The Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, never took anyone's wealth. He lived like a poor person. So in that moment, overwhelmed in emotion, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh said, Ya Rasulullah, Udullaha an yuwasi'a ala ummatik, faqad wasa'a ala farisa, ala, ala farisa war-rum, wa hum la ya'abudun Allah. The Messenger of Allah, 
Why don't you pray to God that he make our affairs easier and give us wealth and abundance? Do you not see how the Roman and Persians live in luxury? Because we went to Rome and Persia, palaces, thrones, entourage, gowns, buffets, you know, servants and lines and lines of soldiers. It was a whole different vibe. And in Medina Munawara, mud homes. In Medina Munawara, everything was simple and easy. When the Persian general came to negotiate with Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh, he was amazed to see the leader of the Muslims, the man at whose command the Roman and Persian Empire collapsed. He was amazed to see that leader, that student of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sleeping on dirt. He was amazed. The guy came from the Persian Empire. He's used to the White House, the Senate. He's used to people traveling in limousines and Air Force One. And Amir al-Mu'mineen lies on dirt. Just, just couldn't believe it. And he asked, why are there no guards here? Why is no one guarding him? They said, well, hakamta adilta fanimta aminta. Right? That you, because the man's just. The reason why he lives in peace is because he's just. And people want him to stay in power. People are happy with him. He, he listens to people. You know, when Umar radiallahu anh was stabbed, the first thing that he asked, was it a Muslim who stabbed me? He said, no, it was someone else. He said, alhamdulillah, that I did not oppress anyone and someone came to seek revenge against me. That man who did stab me, he had his own problems and he raised his concerns of that individual and his presence in Medina Munawwara. That person shouldn't have been in Medina Munawwara to even start with. So he made this observation. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was lying down, fastawa jalis, and he sat up right away. And he said, Afi shakin anta ya ibn al-Khattab. O oh, Omar, are you in some doubt? Ula'ika qawmun ujjidat lahum tayyibatuhum fil hayat al-dunya. They are a people that Allah gave them their luxuries in the world. You shall find your luxuries in the hereafter. It's okay to not have all the wealth of the world. It's okay to live humble, to live simple. You'll focus on other things in life. I know having more wealth is a dream for us all. Who doesn't want it? Who doesn't want to have more luxuries in their life? Everyone does, that's true. But if those luxuries come while you can continue to be a positive contributor to humanity, society, and have a strong relationship with your Allah, then great, let's have them. But if those luxuries come at a cost, if they come at a cost of you not being able to dedicate time to your creator, you're not able to serve humanity, that you lose your soul in the process, that now you're scheming and you're lying and you're cheating and stealing from other people, then from our perspective, it's not worth it. And that's a religious perspective. For a person who doesn't believe, they won't be able to ever understand this perspective. Because we wait for that reward in the hereafter. We're okay with sacrificing this world. For a believer, sacrifice is easy. Because I know that when I give up in this world, there's something waiting for me in equal or better, inshallah, even the better. Uh, in the hereafter, whether it's wealth, whether it's time, you know, any sacrifice that I make. Hafsa radiallahu anha, um, she passed away in the year 41 Hijri, the year that Hassan radiallahu an made truce with, Mu with Muawiyah radiallahu an. Imam Waqidi rahmatullahi alayhi says that it was in the year 45 Hijri. Um, Marwan, the wali of Medina Munawwara, the governor of Medina, led her janazah prayer. She was buried in the graveyard of Baqi'ah. وَعُمْرُهَا سِتُونَ سَنَةً وَقِيلَ ثَلَاثٌ وَسِتُونَ سَنَةً And she was either 60 years old or 63 years old. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate her maqam. May Allah azza wa jalla allow us to learn from her story. Um, again, many lessons that we learn from Hafsa radiallahu anha, from the narrations to her personal life, to Umar radiallahu anha's lessons and his observations. This family was a Mubarak family, and they left so much for us. May Allah azza wa jalla elevate their maqam and uh, make their graves into gardens of paradise and allow us to benefit from their companionship in the hereafter. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.